So when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is real. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. If you will open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 today, we are starting with verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention our Friday night school of the Spirit this week. We'll be studying the gift of discernment, discernment of spirits. Sometimes it's called distinguishing of spirits. So we'll be talking about that. Last week, last Friday night, we studied the gift of miracles. And so I had an opportunity to look at that. That'll be up on our website by Monday night, Tuesday morning sometime. Um, you know, that's where you click on the banner on the front page, and then it'll take you to the page which has all of the message so far in that gift series. Of course, the purpose, one of the purposes of doing the gift series is to make sure that we have something available for people in the future and even outside of our congregation to look at. Um, it isn't often that you take a message, a gift, and really delve into them. It's simply because normally you, would, you, know, you wouldn't take the time. But in our Friday night meetings, because we focus on gifts, we've been doing that all year. Our Friday night meetings will end on, oh, the end of this month. Memorial Day weekend, that Friday night, right before Memorial Day is, is our last Friday night meeting for the summer. So, well, the last Friday night that we are, we have a normal School of the Spirit meeting. Then we'll be having a couple of prayer meetings about the hurricane season during June. That's all on the schedule already. So again, if you'll open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verses, starting with verse 21, we have been doing this study in the book of Ephesians, just going through verse by verse and looking at what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians. It was also a circular letter, very obviously, and so it went out beyond the Ephesians to the churches in Asia Minor, and the Apostle Paul had some key things that he wanted to communicate to them. It's good for us to look at these letters from the Apostle Paul because they're written from the perspective of what the church needs. And the Lord, when he was having his apostles write the letters, was making sure that they were covering topics that we as God's people need to hear. These, top, these letters are timeless in many ways, simply because they deal with the normal things that confront Christian congregations down through the ages. And so it's good for us to be looking at these things. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 and following, we're going to be looking at the marriage relationship Really, it's from the perspective of Christ and the church, meaning the Apostle Paul outlines what it means for Christians to live together in the body of Christ, and then he goes specifically to husbands and wives, and he says, by the way, you want to know the great privilege you have? You reflect Christ's relationship with the church. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Christians especially are supposed to be a reflection in their marriages of how Christ and the church work together. That's an interesting thought. That's why I've entitled today's message, Reflecting Christ's Relationship with the Church. I was going to entitle it The Grace of Submission because honestly that's what a lot of what the reflecting is about as we relate to one another in general in the Christian church. And there certainly is a grace of submission. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. But all of this, living together in the body of Christ, is to reflect his great love for the church and the relationship which he has with us. So we are in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse... 21. It says, submit voluntarily to each other out of sincere respect for Christ. Now, just a reminder, this translation is my translation from the Greek language. I recommend that you have your version open in front of you to see the differences in translations. Like, right up front, you're going to see that many of your translations just say submit to each other, and mine says submit voluntarily to each other. There's a reason for that. And normally your translations make a pastor teacher like me teach what it means, but I, in my translation, make sure that I just put it right in the translation. It's one of the wonderful things that I get to do because I do my own translation. 
However, you should have the ESV or the NISV or the NASB or the King James Version or the New King James Version or whatever your favorite Bible translation is open in front of you so that you can see the differences and make note of them. Okay, so submit voluntarily to each other out of sincere respect for Christ. Some translations say reverence for Christ. Same, same meaning, okay? Submit voluntarily. This is the fourth response to Paul's comment or statement that rather than being intoxicated with wine, rather than seeking to be filled with those type of spirits, we should be being filled with the Spirit of God. And if we are being filled with the Spirit of God, then he had said in the verses just previous, speak to each other with psalms, songs of praise, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to God. Give thanks at all times to our God and Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's three thoughts contained in those verses. Speak to each other using the scripture. Sing and give thanks. And he, then he, he explains them each a little bit more fully, but speak, sing, and give thanks are three things. Well, the fourth part of this, because it's just following along, is verse 21. It's just this, it's, it's, there's four parts after being filled. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, these four things should mark your life. You should be speaking God's truth to one another in a variety of different ways, singing in your heart, making melody in your heart, being joyful in your heart. You need to be giving thanks. And then you need to be Submitting voluntarily to one another. So there's four things that mark a Christian being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, all of these things are hard. All of these things won't work very well. If you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, and the reason I say be being filled, even though the translation I didn't make say that, is because that's, that's a very pedantic translation of that particular word. Be being filled. It doesn't work real well you know, as you're reading it, so we just write be filled. But it really does mean continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is the fourth response to being filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's about voluntary submission to one another. If the Christian church is going to work, there needs to be a grace of submission flowing in it. Otherwise, we are going to have problems. By the way, the reason I can translate it as voluntary submission, it is a Greek middle verb. It literally is, you could translate it something like, uh, submit yourself to. It definitely is, it means voluntary. Submit yourself to each other. It's not make others submit to you. <laughs> submit yourself. In other words, submit voluntarily to each other. And that's, that's a, a whole different ballgame than trying to command submission. And so that really is what we need to do. In order to make this body of Christ work, we need to be people who are willing to submit to each other voluntarily in order to get the job done. Now, Paul is going to explain this a lot more fully as we go on, especially as he talks about relationships during our time of studying this. And today we're only going to be getting into the husband and wife relationship, but he's going to get into the children-parent relationship. He's going to get into the uh, servant-master relationship, which in our culture is more employer-employee. And uh, he's going to be talking about a lot of different relationships that we run into in our culture or that are set up by God. And... He starts out by simply saying, submit to each other. If you are a Christian who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you and by the way, that's every Christian, being filled with the Holy Spirit is, means when you accept Christ, Jesus showed up on the Resurrection Sunday and he breathed on his disciples. Remember that. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Spirit came on them. And that was the start of the church. A lot of people say the start of the church was Pentecost. No, it was when, the Holy, when Jesus breathed on them and they said, receive the Holy Spirit. The church started, the empowering of the church was Pentecost. It doesn't really matter if people are off by 40 days or you know, whatever, but it's, it's just the way it is. The, uh, the picture of be being filled by the Spirit of God allows us then to move into these arenas so that we are able to do what God has called us to do in a voluntary way. The Holy Spirit is quite capable of knocking an unbeliever off his horse 
I always envisioned Paul on a horse, but you know he could have been on his feet too. As he was walking over to Damascus or riding over to Damascus, he could have been on a wagon for goodness sakes. However, whatever happened to him, he was knocked off his feet or his horse or his wagon and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And dragged him. Now Paul was an absolute arch enemy of the church and of uh, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? You know what? I've called you to be one of my people I'm going to send out and to make a change in the world for my name, and you've been an idiot. Okay, that's, a lot of that's just paraphrase. <laughs> so I've been wooing you, and you've been ignoring me, so here I am. Boom! God knocked his blinders off, and Paul had to weep for days and days and days. He also lost his sight. I mean, he had to get it restored. When Ananias shows up to pray for him, he says, the Lord is going to show you how much you are going to suffer for him because you have a calling as an apostle, and that is one of the things that apostles do. They go out and they do the things that are necessary to open up new areas to the church, and that always involves some level of suffering because you're never received whenever you're trying to break new paradigms into you just never received it's just there's always that thing that reacts against it so the holy spirit is quite capable of working against someone's will when they are obstinately refusing the call that god has on them in their life especially when it talks about bringing them from being an unbeliever into a believer however Generally speaking, once we come into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit woos us. The Holy Spirit is in this situation where when we submit to his calling, we submit voluntarily. It's how God's kingdom works. It's how we work in the body of Christ. It's, it is, well, it's a way that we end up not dominating each other and taking away our free will and doing the things which actually hurt all of us rather than help us. So submit voluntarily to each other out of sincere respect for Christ, and that's the whole picture. This is built on respect for Christ. It's part of submitting to Christ. It's by submitting to one another. Because we've got a command in Scripture that says, hey, by the way, if you want to submit to Christ, you also need to work on making sure that you are in proper submission to one another. It flows from being filled with the Holy Spirit, which is why I call it a grace. It is a grace of submission because it's a grace that you get when you are being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holman Bible Commentary, as it is commenting on this particular scripture, says, in the overall scheme of things, God has placed all of us in differing positions of authority and submission. A person may be in authority at home, but submissive at work. Another may be in submission at home and in authority at work. The point is, all social order depends on people's willingness to work together and ability to determine who is the head of certain endeavors. In our work environment, submission is usually... Uh, it can be coerced through, you know, you'll get fired or you'll get dock pay or you won't get a paycheck. However, in every work environment, it works far better when people are voluntarily submitting to one another and they are there to help the team work. Even in a work environment, coercion is not the best opportune way to make things work. In fact, servant leadership is one of the big things that is happening in the corporate world and has been happening for quite some time because of the fact that you get more happy and productive employees who are healthier when you are actually setting things up that people want to be involved rather than coerce being involved. Okay, submit voluntarily to each other out of sincere respect for Christ. Then verse 22 is wives submit voluntarily to your husbands as to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church, himself savior of the body. As the church voluntarily submits to Christ, so also wives should submit voluntarily to their husbands in everything. Okay. The Apostle Paul is talking now about, he makes the switch. Again, he's going to talk about husband-wife relationships as they reflect Christ's relationship with the church, he's going to talk about children-parent relationships, and then he's going to talk about what we would call employer-employee relationships. As he's trying to say, now how do we as Christians, as we are attempting to live in the culture in which we live, how are we best going to function as, 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 as the people of God that we're supposed to be? So, he says, wives, notice I have submit voluntarily in italics because here um, there is no verb. Because it didn't need a verb. Verse 21 gave us the verb. 
Submit to one another voluntarily out of reverence for Christ. That's where the verb is. And then he goes to, and in the Greek language, very common, he doesn't need to repeat the verb because of the fact that you already know what the verb is. And so now you can just say, wives, by the way, you do it this way. So we in English like to have the verb repeated. And so I put it in italics. Wives, submit voluntarily to your husbands as to the Lord. Um, this is really an application of verse 21. That's why the verb is missing. He's just simply saying, well, verse 21 is here, and now we will go on. By the way, the whole premise is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not being, being filled with the Holy Spirit, none of this is going to work. Did you get that little key there? That's why I'm emphasizing be being filled with the Holy Spirit. None of this will work. It'll be coercive, it'll be negative, it'll be awful. Unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we actually have the grace to make this stuff work and then it works the way that it's supposed to work and it reflects Christ and his relationship to the church I mean because we can all think of horrible situations in the marriage relationship where when you look at these verses you go oh no that's awful that would never work well you're right unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit and then it's two people trying to outdo each other in how they serve each other in the way that they are called to so let's look a little bit more closely at this um, the, as the Apostle Paul is going on, he says, Wives, submit voluntarily to your husbands as to the Lord. This is your way of the application. That's why it's submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And now, in the same way, if you're in the marriage relationships, Christ, uh, wives, you submit as if you are submitting to the Lord because this is the way that you are doing it. You aren't submitting to your husband, in essence. You are submitting to Jesus, who is saying this is the way that the relationship is going to work. And here's the reason. The husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church. Uh, by the way, there's two meanings for head. The, the, the Greek word used for head can mean the source. And, and it's interesting because who came first, Adam or Eve? Well, Adam. And where did Eve come from? Adam. You know, it's interesting now that women are the ones who give birth, but Adam was the first one who gave birth. I mean, that's true, right? God puts him to sleep, and it was a C-section. He took out, you know, rib and bone and organs or whatever, and he formed Eve from Adam. Adam had the building blocks that it, God formed Eve out of. You have to understand, that's the picture. And when you're talking about that rabbinic, Paul was a rabbinic teacher. This is definitely in view. Adam came first. The husband came first. But Adam was the one who was first on the earth. That's what he's saying. That's the order. That's what the headship thing means. He says, because God put Adam here first and then Eve, this is the way that it's going to work. What was Adam's job description, which he failed miserably at? He was supposed to tell Eve, by the way, Eve, God is trustworthy and wonderful and kind and we can believe him and trust in him. And by the way, when he tells us to worship him by leaving that particular tree alone, we need to be able to listen to that because we can trust God in all things. Adam's job, as given by God, was to do one thing. And he failed to do it, which is why we have a mess. Now, it's the focus is on Eve when you look at the fall into sin. But then it says at, she gave some of the, she, was, she took the fruit and she ate and she gave some to her husband who was with her through the entire event. Adam failed at his job description, but his job description was to be there and to bring protection to his family by pointing out the way that it's supposed to work, the way God described it to us, and he failed failed at this very basic, very basic job that he had been given. So, the husband is the head of the right wife as Christ is the head of the church. What, well, let's see. Christ is the head of the church. He's the source of the church. Is that true? You bet it is. He sent the Holy Spirit. He calls us into the relationship of the body of Christ. He is definitely the source of the church. We look at the word headship and we think, power. We're all, we're all Greeks at heart, Gentiles, right? Well, at heart, it's like it's all about power. Don't be like the Gentiles or the Greeks, lording it over one another. But we fall right back into that thing all of the time. It's all about power. If he's talking about headship, it means power. No, it doesn't. It means responsibility. 
Because now we have a role, and that's why the Apostle Paul says, um, the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And by the way, how do we know he's talking about source and protection and all the things that Adam was supposed to do and he didn't do? Because look what he, how he describes Christ right away. By the way, Jesus himself is the savior of the body. What did the savior of the body do? He gave his life so that the body would be healthy. He did his job making sure that the body would be saved, protected, and he's still doing that job. So when we look at this particular thing, it's not about power. It's about responsibility. It's about the fact that Adam was the one who was formed first. He was supposed to be the one who brought protection and made sure that he was able to communicate with Eve clearly the things that God had said to him to bring protection to his family, and he did not do it. Christ is the second Adam, and he did the job right. And we have the opportunity to model that in our relationships with those around us. Ah. So he says, hey, um, Christ is the head of the church and he takes care of the church. That is the, the headship model is taking care of the body. That's what we're going to see very clearly. Christ is the head of the church. He takes care of it. He protects it. He nurtures it. He watches over it. And as the church voluntarily submits to Christ, again, the same Greek word, middle, it's voluntarily submission that we're talking about. As the church voluntarily submits to Christ, so also wives should submit voluntarily to their husbands in everything. This is the model for the church. This is, we're going to reflect Christ. Now you look at that and you say, man, that, that sounds, the wife should submit to voluntarily to their husband in everything? Now, if you stop right here, it could be annoying. It's not going to be annoying by the time we get to the next section. You got to say, you mean I have to trust that? He can be a jerk sometimes. In fact, sometimes he ain't filled with the Holy Spirit. There's, sometimes I'm wondering if there's a few demons in there. Man. Okay, let's go on before I get into too deep of weeds. Anyway, by the way, the model for the church is Jesus. The model is how Jesus treated... This is what he says to his disciples in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Do you hear the, the relationship that Jesus wanted to have with his body, with those who followed him? He wants a relationship of friendship. That's why it's voluntary submission. If you're forcing people to do things, is it, where's the friendship in that? We submit voluntarily to our friends all of the time because we trust their best interest for us. And so we make decisions and we voluntarily submit to whatever it is. By the way, the word for voluntary submission, it's, it really means just you put your will under someone else's will. That's all it means. And it's the idea that if you're walking up to the front of a store, I like to use the illustration of a 7-Eleven, but you walk up to the front of a 7-Eleven and there's a whole crowd of people headed in that way, you have a choice. You can open the door and just barge right in or you can hold the door and let other people go in. You know, someone's got to submit to someone else's will so that everyone gets in the door. Because if you all try to go in at the same time, it ain't working. And so we subordinate our will under each other in order to make things work. Christ is the model for the church that we need to be able to follow. Christ is the model of our relationships with one another, even in the marriage bond so that we actually make the relationship work. I, I got more annoyed than I can tell you. I'm, I'm admitting something here. Okay, pay close attention. I was at an event years and years ago. The man involved that was speaking was a man who had, was a well-known Christian pastor and lecturer on the speaking circuit. And I was with a, I had gone to a meeting where there were lots of pastors and it was a, uh, just a general meeting in the body of Christ. Well-known man, if I said his name, you'd, you'd know who he was. And um, while I'm there, and just one little addition, the guy had had a fracture in his marriage relationship, not so good. But now he has been restored, which is good. We're always so good about that and we're happy about that when the restoration happens. But he's up in front of the rest of the pastors now because he's going to be speaking about his experiences and his mistakes, which is very beneficial. But this is what he said. Free your wife from being your friend. She's your wife. I took offense. I, I, I was not happy. 
because I thought to myself, my wife is my best friend. Now, but not everyone has that. You understand? Not everyone has that. It's okay. You go with what you got. But the idea that this man was standing up in the front of the room and saying, your wife is your wife. Free her from being your friend. Let other people be your friends. Well, you can have other friends. But in, the way it works for me is my wife is my best friend. And I believe that that is a healthy... I believe that's what this scripture talks about. And that we need to be developing a relationship, husbands and wives, so that friendships grow. Then the rest of it's easy. Because you know each other. And you're able to work through each other. You know, the interesting thing about our marriage relationship, which extends back into distant history. <laughs> Just yesterday, she said. Um, is that we virtually, I mean, there's, there's I, re, I mean, we walk in unanimity of spirit. It's, it's not like we have, well, we need to, all of our, the things that we do are built on agreement. And if it ever comes down to a situation where there has to be one decision made and we're not quite sure which direction to go, I know what she's going to say. She's going to say, well, let's go with your idea. And she's going to do that automatically because she trusts me. And it's not just because later on she can say if it didn't work, see, well, it didn't work. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, pay attention. This is teaching us about the relationship of Christ and the church at the same time. Pay attention. If you want to know about our relationship to Christ at a higher level and his whole purpose, look at the marriage relationship when it's done right. Okay? It's going to help us in our relationship with Christ too. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself on her behalf. Now, this is the verse that most people skip over very quickly because they think, well, it's easy to love your wife, especially if we're talking about sexual love or, rev or friendship love. Oh, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about those things. We're using the Greek word agapao, which is, I mean, we know it in the noun form much better, agape. And so when he says, love your wives, husbands, by the way, your job description is to love your wives. And by the way, do it just like Christ loved the church. By the way, how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave his life for the church. He let the Romans nail him to a cross when he could have got up at any time and called legions of angels to his side. But for the benefit of the church, he let those spikes be driven through his wrists and through his feet. Oh, so this love thing that we're being asked to do for our wives is not quite as easy as it sounds, is it? Well, when's the last time you had a big spike driven through your wrist? This is a lot worse than just having your breakfast burnt. <laughs> By the way, that was what the Pharisees, they, would, they had gotten into that legalism. The, Jesus, way Jesus had to, the reason Jesus had to be able to start working with divorce in Matthew 19 is there was teachings out there among some of the rabbinic scholars that said, you know, you know, if you find something displeasing about your wife, you can divorce her. And some of the um, rabbis taught that that means if she burns your dinner or your breakfast, that's enough displeasing that you, just, you can divorce her for those reasons. Because obviously, scripturally, that is beyond the pale. That's something displeasing. And they violated what scripture said about the two will become one flesh because they focused solely on their own deal, misunderstanding totally what it meant to love your wife and to sacrifice on behalf of the family. It's self-sacrificial love. What did um, Jesus do for the church? He, lived the, he fulfilled the law perfectly. He entered into his ministry right around the age 30, and he lived perfectly as a public figure being tested every step of the way on behalf of the church and he lived those previous 30 years perfectly on behalf of the church because of the fact that he, he knew what was best for the church, for the people that he wanted to have relationship with. Husbands, love your wives just as also Christ loved the church. It's got to be modeled after Christ's love. It's got to be self-sacrificial pouring out on behalf of your wife. That is what we do. 
If you are not doing that, it means you are not be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because this is all flowing. This is, this is Ephesians 5.21. Submit voluntarily to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, how do you submit in the marriage relationship? You prefer your husband's will to your own. Husbands, how do you submit in the marriage relationship? You die to make sure that everything in your relationship is functioning appropriately as you can make it. Sometimes when I'm doing marriages, I say that means that the um, wife has the job of submitting to a person who is supposed to die to make her as happy and secure as he can possibly do it. Doesn't sound so hard when you put it that way, does it? Honestly, that means if the husband's doing his job, this is not a hard thing for the wife because it's going to be built on friendship, mutual agreement. This is one of the commentators wrote this, the Expositor's Bible commentary. In Greco-Roman society, it was recognized that wives had obligations to their husbands, but not vice versa. Isn't that convenient? In this, as in other respects, Christianity introduced a revolutionary approach to marriage that equalized the rights of wives and husbands and established the institution on a much firmer foundation than ever before. That was what Christianity brought to the mix. Now, did Christianity mess up after a few hundred years? Yes, of course. They got into that same medieval thing. They got into the priesthood thing. When you get into the priesthood model, it's automatically a patriarchal model, and women are, again, subordinated. But that, wasn't, that was only because the church messed up, not because that's the way that God intended it. So, verses... 26 through 27, in order, he gave himself, in order, he starts out with an in order, I, I, I split up a sentence, in order that he might purify her, this is why he gave herself on, his, himself on behalf of the church, in order that he might purify her, having cleansed her with the washing of water by the word, so that he might present her to himself a magnificent church, having no stain or wrinkle or any other such thing, but that she be holy and blameless. This is Christ's plan for the church, Christ's purpose. It was to purify his fiancée. That's why he gave himself. He wanted to make certain that she was all that she could be for him as he stepped into relationship with her. It says he wanted to purify her, having cleansed her. Ah, the cleansing process. The washing of water by the word. If you don't hear the echoes of baptism in that, you're missing it. In uh, Acts chapter 22, when the Apostle Paul is describing what happened to him when Ananias came to the uh, house he was at after he had been called by Christ, knocked off his horse or his feet or whatever, he said this, he described when, what Ananias said to him. He says, then Ananias said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, or wash your sins away, calling on his name. So Ananias, when he's with the Apostle Paul, says, now it's time to get identified with Christ through baptism. You get up, you get your sins washed away as you go through this process, calling on the name of Jesus. It isn't that the water has that power, it's the word. The washing of the water through the word. It is the calling on the name of Jesus. Calling on the name of Jesus means you are receiving him and everything that he is. And that's washing away the sin in your life. Baptism is not a, um, one of those things that we just do mechanically. Baptism is something that has great meaning and purpose as we call on the name of Jesus. And it releases this cleansing process in us. He cleansed his bride with the washing of the water by the word so that he might present her to himself a magnificent church. Oh. He wanted to make sure that as he's preparing her to become his bride, that there's something magnificent about her. What was magnificent about her is that she would ha she'd be without stain, she'd be without wrinkle, or any other thing like that. That's literally what the Greek says there. I know the NIV translates it without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. It really says without spot, wrinkle, or anything like that. If you have the NASB, you'll point, it says that type of translation. But it is no stain, no wrinkle, his whole purpose is that she be holy and blameless. And so Jesus is in the business of preparing his bride. That's what he did. He gave himself so that he would have 
a bride, a fiancé, someone who'd be able to step into relationship with him. And we have been courting him ever since, right? We have been in this relationship getting to know who he is so that we can be the bride without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. We can be the ones who look the role magnificent. Some of your translations, glorious. It's, 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 it's the picture of everything, that the shiny radiance that God wants us to bear. And so because of this is what Christ has done for the church, the Apostle Paul says, thus husbands also ought to love their wives as their own bodies. The one loving his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own physical body, but feeds it and takes care of it, just as also Christ the church, because we are members of his body. Husbands also ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, I have a change, two, two different ways of referring to this in my translation, because there is, uh, a, I have the word body there or the word physical body. It's interesting, the Greek word soma means body. It's just a general word for body. But then there's the word flesh, and that means physical body. Body is just more of a general word for body. You can talk about a body of believers, the body of Christ, soma. But when you're talking about physical body, that's sarks, often translated flesh. And so I did not want to get into this whole flesh thing because, again, it's something that doesn't communicate to us. However, when in a section like this, it, what does communicate to us is he's talking about our physical bodies and our something else that is a little bit less focused. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He's just a very generic phrase about the fact that, hey, we take care of our own bodies, and that's true. It's, you know, we, have, we have these bodies that we take care of them. Um, the one loving his own wife loves himself. And so we've got this, this is the nature of the relationship. Sacrificial love for our wife is sacrificial love for self. Because that's how close the husband and wife relationship is supposed to be. If we are laying down our lives on behalf of our wives, husbands, we are taking care of ourselves, our body. We are that close with our Wives, well-balanced people take care of their own body. I put well-balanced there because there are people who have mental illness or there are people who are demonized and they don't take care of themselves. But obviously he's talking in general terms. Balanced people take care of their own bodies. They make sure that they are presentable when they go out. Most of you did not just get up out of bed and come to church with bedhead this morning. You took care of yourself. You got in at least ran a brush through your hair. Most of you hit the shower, you know, put on some makeup and, you know, well, the female part put on the makeup, hopefully, in our culture. That's usually the way it works. But the, uh, I have makeup on right now, but it's only because I'm in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. That was a... Nice whistle there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well-balanced people take care of their own body. And so when the Apostle Paul's talking about the husband wife relationship, he's saying, you know, guys, this would be silly not to take care of your wives because you'd be violating your own body in the way it is. And of course, Christ does exactly the same for the church. So when we as husbands honor our wives and love them and take care of them in the best possible way, helping them to become what God intends for them to be, that's just a model of how Christ works with the church. That's how he pours out on us. He wants us to become everything that we can be. And so he pours in his promises and his grace and everything that is there. I was reading in the, in I, in the book of Isaiah, I was reading about Ahaz again when he was told by God, you know, he's surrounded by the enemy, right? Sennacherib and his evil Assyrian troops are out there and they're attacking him. And Isaiah says, you got to have faith. If you don't have faith now, it'll never work for you. And then he says this, ask God for any sign. Remember Ahaz's evil response, oh, I won't put God to the test. Even though God was the one inviting him to ask for a sign. So here's the thing, God says to Ahaz, you need to have faith. Ask me for any sign to build your faith. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Oh, to me, that's like, Right now, I know that whenever my faith is faltering, I can ask God for signs to build my faith. 
I can ask for him to speak to me. I can ask for him to show me. I can ask for him to affirm the path that I'm on because he wants me to have faith and I just have to admit to him, Lord, I need lots of encouragement from you to be able to continue to walk in the faith that you want me to have. That's what we do. Christ does the same for the church, that what he does for the church, we do in our families. We do what we can so that our spouses can be everything that God intended them to be. I just made that generic on purpose because I'm making an application. This application is simply this. If you look at your spouse after 20 years of marriage and you're not happy, it's your fault. Your job description as a husband and your job description as a wife is to take the raw material that God has given you in that relationship. Now, by the way, your husband or your wife can be a jerk and filled with sin and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, be aware of that. I'm talking about those where two people are growing together and they are trying to serve the Lord in their relationship. We've got to go back to Ephesians 5, 21. However, if after 20 years... Your spouse is still tentative and not willing to take risks and do that sort of things. That is where you have fallen down because you're not building in them the confidence that they have to be able to step forward. That's our job description, to be able to give confidence when we are both walking together in the Lord. Okay, now, the Apostle Paul says we are members of his body, of Christ, for this reason. He goes right back to Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will be for one physical body. And that's an odd construction, but that's the way it is in the Greek language, and I wanted to capture it. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will be for one physical body. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking to Christ and to the church. Okay, so the Apostle Paul, as he's talking about this relationship between husband and wife and between Christ and the church, he brings up the Genesis 2.24 scripture where Adam says after Eve is taken out of his body and she has been created from him and he looks at her, he says, wow, for this reason, this is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, verse 23, and then for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be glued, be united, cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh is the way we translate Genesis 2.24 in the Old Testament. He, in, in this Greek translation, it says, for one physical body. He says, we're not talking about soma even. We're talking about something that's so intimate and close that it's a physical body. And that's interesting because then he instantly says, by the way, I'm not talking about husbands and wife right now. I'm talking about how close Christ is to his church. And that's why he called, and you look at that, you go, huh? Because you're certain he's talking about husband and wives when he quotes Genesis 2.24. And he says, no, no, I'm not talking... I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about Christ in the church. You look at verse 24 of Genesis chapter 2 again that he quotes here, you go, huh? That is Paul, and that's why he says it's a mystery. And you go, you bet it's a mystery. God must have given you more insight than he's given us. And the answer to that is yes, he spent quite a bit of time with Paul. But Paul says, hey, this is a mystery. The mystery, that has many implications for the church. That's why the husband and wife, a healthy husband and wife relationship reflects a lot of what's going on between Christ and his bride. Christ and his church. And we can learn a lot about our relationship with Christ and build a lot of confidence. Because i got to tell you, if the marriage relationship has been built in the best possible way, and by the way, if your marriage relationship, you're looking back and you're feeling really awful right now because you're saying, I didn't build it right, great, mercies, God's mercies are new every morning. Yeah. So, you're a human being and you did it wrong. Welcome to the club. Every step of the way in a marriage relationship, there's forgiveness, there's difficult times, there's, there's good times, there's bad times, it's the way it is. We get through life together, and you end up being a team eventually. And even marriages that were never that close and were argumentative and had all sorts of problems, you get into the latter years of the marriage relationship, and there's usually a, a man and a woman who are actually glad to be with one another because they have overcome the difficulties of life in spite of their imperfections, and they have been able to get through them. They have survived. And there's something which is very comforting about that. Those of you who have been through divorce, you know that there's a ripping that happens through that. There is a tearing, and it takes healing first, and it takes a lot of trust, because this relationship is supposed to be about trust, and there's something that happened that tore that trust. Whether it's the way that you were treated, whether it's the, whatever. But something happened that made the marriage relationship into something that did not survive. 
And you say, okay, I, I, I can either focus on all the negatives of that or I can focus on the fact that I've got a husband in Christ or I've got a bride in my, the body of Christ around me. I can grow in my new relationships in a way that shows that I'm, I'm understanding, I'm learning more, and I'm forgiving the people that have hurt me in my life. And then look at the way this thing is supposed to work with Christ. In the same way that husband and wives are supposed to reflect a one physical body relationship, in all of what that means, it's mysterious. In that same way, Christ is supposed to reflect that with the church. It's a great mystery, but I'm speaking to Christ and to the church. I'm, I'm, not, you, I'm not speaking right now to a man and a woman. As he's using this verse, he's talking about Christ and the church. And then he says this is that mystery, by the way, the Latin word is sacramentum. That means mystery. Which moved the translators from the Greek language to the Latin in the Roman Catholic Church to translate it as a mystery, but it, you know, sacramentum is sacrament. And so that's why marriage is treated as a sacrament in the Roman Catholic Church because of the fact that the word mystery was translated in one of the uses of sacramentum, but then it became a sacrament. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, there is something that is much more sacramental about marriage in it. But it's, it's really based upon a Latin translation from the Greek. And uh, that's why Protestants don't use marriage as a sacrament. We've got sacraments are baptism, and the Lord's Supper in the Protestant church. That's, that's it. The, the sacred things that God has given us as symbols or as prophetic messages about his love for us. So the Latin word is used is mystery, sacramentum, but it means mystery. And he's speaking to Christ and the church. He's keeping the relationship of Christ and church in the view. However, he also wants to make sure he's under husbands and wives understand they reflect this in their relationship. So I'm also speaking to you as individuals. Let each husband love his own wife just as he loves himself and his wife should respect her husband. This is verse 33. This is the application to husbands and wives. And he's saying, by the way, in the same way that I just said that about Christ and the church, that applies to you. Husbands, you need to love your wives. Wives, you need to respect your husbands. And if you're doing that thing, something is going to happen in that relationship that makes it reflect Christ even more. So he gets to the bottom line. What does it mean to submit to one another in love voluntarily? Well, in the Christian church, it means what we do is we work together. And he's going to go through a lot more of that, and he has other scriptures about the fact, even in the book of Hebrews, it talks about relationships in the church and how everyone needs to submit to one another. But right now, he's focused on a very basic relationship of husband and wife because we reflect Christ. And we need the grace of submission in order to make this thing work. And that's why he finishes the whole thing off. He says, by the way, I'm speaking to you as individuals also. And husbands, you need to love your wife just as you love yourself. And wives, you need to respect your husband. Now here, here's what goes on in a marriage relationship. If a husband loves his wife as he loves himself and gives himself sacrificially, he will let his wife know that she can trust him implicitly if he is always there to help build her up she'll become what God intends her to be because he's supposed to be the primary person who represents Christ to her not as a priest priesthood is Old Testament as a partner as a member of the body of Christ together and so what happens is we come together and the husbands need to be the biggest cheerleaders for their wives to be able to let them know that they can do this thing that they have been called to do so they blossom into what God has called them to be. And when there is a disagreement between husband and wife where they just absolutely, there's two ways to go and they don't know which way to go, the wife says, you know what, I trust you enough that I'm going to let you make the decision because of the fact that you so much are making decisions on what you think is best for me. And then what happens? It either works out or it doesn't. If it doesn't, the wife has a job. And that job is to respect and encourage her husband. Because he knows full well he failed in his decision-making process if it doesn't work out. You don't think that your husband doesn't know that? When they make a choice and it turns out to be a mistake, if the wife turns around and says something negative at that particular point in time, it's awful. Because the confidence gets stolen. The husband knows full well that they have made a mistake. 
and more than likely will apologize to it. And you know the role of the wife at that particular point in time is to say, yeah, we'll get it right in the future. That's how we learn, by making mistakes. Wisdom is built on our mistakes. The things that say, I trust in you, I believe in you. And if husband and wives are doing that to each other, if they're trusting for the best from their spouse, that's when a marriage relationship grows and grows and grows and it begins to reflect the glory of God that was intended to be reflected. That's what Dawn and I want you to see in us. We want you to see the partnership that God has given us. We have people, a part of our wider ministry network, who tell us that when they pray for us, they can never pray for us individually. They just said, it, there's, it, it's, it's not Randy, Dawn. They can never pray except Randy and Dawn because of the fact that they see us as such one. And to me, that is a major compliment because it means that there's something about our relationship that we're doing right. Now, by the way, over the years, I could tell you the things we've done wrong too, but I'm not going to focus on that right now. <laughs> there's forgiveness and that's all there, okay? But there is this part of our relationship that we want to reflect the glory of God in so that people see something which gives them hope. Especially if their relationship has not been as solid. Especially when they hear, God forbid, that some pastor in some church somewhere has fallen once again. We want to model it right. I covet your prayers for that. I, Dawn and I want to be a shining example of what a husband and wife are supposed to be like in a marriage relationship. And that means we need, we need to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because this doesn't come from our flesh. This does not come from our, our great internal wisdom. This comes from the Spirit of God. And so when you're thinking about us, just say a prayer. And ask that God do something in our marriage that has an impact on this congregation positively and on the community positively always. Because we're reflecting Christ's relationship to us. So are you if you're married. And we need to get very good at doing that because the world's got to see what it is that Christ really did design into this thing. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity today to focus on what it means for Christians to exist together in your body and how we need to relate to each other in your body as Christians those who are filled with your Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul dealt with those who are in believers and unbeliever relationships back in 1 Corinthians 7. And we didn't get into any of that today for the most part. But we're talking about when a husband and wife are both filled with the Holy Spirit, are both in relationship. And we are asking, Lord, that those of us who have that privilege would truly live up to the opportunity we have to reflect you and your relationship to your church. Give us the grace to do this, Lord. It is beyond us as people, but it's not beyond us as spirit-filled members of your body. Give us that grace. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.